OK, welcome. This is the DDS presentation. Uh, my name is Lars. I'm currently working for uh, Data Response. And uh, I'm going to present my experience with the DDS protocol. Uh, I'm going to show and um, there was a customer, uh, Elstein, wanted to use DDS, wanted to try this, and Data Response got involved. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that project. Uh, then I'm going to go through some uh, protocols, like you can call them competitors, try to place DDS on the huge tree of different um, protocols, and go deeper into DDS, and then at the end, I'm going to try run my very ambitious uh, demo project here, if everything goes according to plan. Um, I've done all the hardware work myself, and I'm a software guy, so this is going to be interesting. As usually, what fails first is the soldering just goes up. And I've also transported this on the train, and so yeah, let's just try. OK, so Elstein which you might know makes ships. And uh, they build the ships, and they also make the control system for the ship. Um, what we have a picture of here is a very nice boat. And here is the, an example of the control system in the bridge. And uh, what Ulstein set out to do was to create a new control system for uh, a boat. Um, on, to make such a control system, you need to get a grip on all the analog digital input outputs that is existing on the boat. And um, they are all gathered in uh, I.O. cabinets. Uh, for instance, the propulsion system has one or two or maybe three cabinets full of I.O. controllers. And these I.O. controls are usually PLCs. So they handle the low-level Modbus, RS-485, CAN bus, all that stuff. Happens in those cabinets. And all those data become digital analog signals. <laughs> or not analog signals, they, they are digital, but you know, like numbers and bits. Then they need to be presented around the boat and um, on operator system on operator stations and on panels and they need to be logged and as an example we have a view of a gas tank uh, cargo here this is uh, from the final product but it's just to show the complexity of the task um, let's say the boat has uh, several tanks filled with gas. You want to keep track of how much is in each tank. You want to be able to open and close valves to uh, control this. And maybe you want to pump, like here. Pump here, valves everywhere, and tanks with a percentage of usage. And the signals that are important here are tank levels, alarms, valves, pumps, etc. Like, for instance, the yellow P2 there means it's an alarm because it's a low level. And then you have P1, which is too high level on the tank. So usually when you build such a system, you expect to do a lot of manual labor, like a lot of engineering work to get all the signals to the right places. You have to sit down and configure every PLC and set up everything, which takes a lot of hours to design a new ship. So Ulstein had previously attempted to make a message-based middleware to, uh, to control the ship. They tried to make a control system by themselves from scratch based on uh, Modbus TCP, and uh, they tried to make the quality of service themselves. But it didn't scale very well. Um, 
there was just latency. Uh, it was very hard to control because all the data was going everywhere and everyone was processing everything. So that was tricky. And also, since they used middleware that was based from the vendors, uh, the bonds getting tight to the hardware vendors. So you're stuck with one type of IO controller all around your ship. And that's not a very flexible solution. You can't customize uh, the cost of the ship that way if you only use one provider. Like, if you can choose between three or four different providers, you can put them up against each other and you can make things cheaper. So that was a kind of a big motivation for them. So what I set out to do was to make a scalable distributed control system that used rugged and standardized components and communication uh, with a layered and testable software design, which was hardware EO independent. So that was kind of ambitious. They also wanted to do it in a very short amount of time. And, uh, and I don't have that big developer uh, base themselves. So hence the response as well. But you also have to start thinking, what can we buy that is already working? So they chose uh, to use DDS for the middleware. It's scalable, distributed. And I wanted to make a system where you can plug and play everything. Um, you, um, you can take this computer with Linux on it and an application. Just plug it to the ring of the network here. And then it's just supposed to work. So imagine this is a panel that is supposed to show the, uh, the tanks we were looking at earlier. Then this would be configured in a configuration program to show all the tank signals, all the signals that has to do with them. Then you would just plug it in and assume it's working. And uh, sometimes it does. So the software, to be rugged and standard, they based it on Linux and shows a lot of open standardized software libraries like Boost, C++ standard libraries, stuff like that. And then the DDS. Um, and they tried to make it layered so that you only focus on your business logic and your functionality. Then you let DDS do all the middleware stuff. And then you can also make test functionality and just plug it right into the DDS network. Uh, and also, to make it hardware vendor independent, they had to build a layer of DDS on top of all the PLCs. So they were basically telling the vendors that we want an API to your uh, I.O. controllers. And then we want to mix that with DDS and make all the data available directly on the DDS uh, network. So that was the task at hand. And here is uh, an example of the result. Um, you have, this is an alarm view of a boat that it's of course a simulator because they have 956 alerts, so you wouldn't want to be on this ship. Um, and as you can see, there are P1 alerts, which means high priority, and then you have yellow alerts, which are not that hard, high priority. And what I'm hoping to illustrate with this, this is a snapshot of their graphical user interface. And what I'm hoping to illustrate is that they have set up a filter on this and said, we want all alarms. Then you have the different sections of the ship in the circle here. It's impossible to read, but it's like engines, power management, propulsion, propulsion cooling. Um, and then you take this graphical user interface, you plug it into the network ring, and everything just appears magically. Uh, and I'm going to tell you how and 
how that works. But uh, in, um, in summary, the, the Ostein project ended up being a flexible control system where the DDS greatly reduced the development time. And uh, we came up with a term during the development um, that this was like a happy magic cloud because, uh, because you have a discovery pro protocols. So when you plug things into the network, uh, DDS automatically reads the data and you set up which data you want. So you have the feeling that there's some kind of magic going on. Data just goes wherever you want it to go, which was nice. I'm not going to go very much into detail um, about the Alstein. It's more like just a show off of a happy project using DDS. But maybe there are questions about the Alstein st stuff before I head on to the technical protocols. Yeah? Yeah, safety, like you want uh, alarms to show up and... No, but uh, there might be safety issues, uh, critical systems as well. Mm. Were there any considerations that during the project you were involved uh, Yeah, briefly. Um, with the, the alarms, uh, you have... Um, prioritization in the graphical, but you also have, uh, you can also set up that the type of data that you have will have priority over the other data. So I guess uh, if you have an alarm, you would set it to prioritize over everything else. So if your system is very loaded, then the alarm would get through and other data might get delayed. And so that can be handled. As for security and hacking and stuff, that wasn't considered. Like uh, someone could probably connect to this system and start sniffing the DDS data, but that's quite common in such chip networks. You, uh, DDS has started making a DDS secure, which will meet this requirement, but we didn't experiment with that during this project. Any others? So when working with the DDS, uh, it's nice to know where the DDS places itself in uh, relation to other big standards. Like why do you need DDS? You have other internet server cloud um, standards to choose from. And uh, especially when it comes to Internet of Things, which is a buzzword, so I have to have it there. Um, you want to know like which protocols exist and why do you want to choose DDS for your task. And then you need to consider where your software is placed. Um, if it's fast, you want to stay in the device-to-device -device domain where devices communicate little pieces of data all the time. Then you have the device to server, which is more like you can say device to cloud or data pushing up to the internet. And then you have server to server, which is other protocols. And you have, for example, XMPP, which is the Extendable Messaging Presence Protocol, which was made for uh, instant messaging and works best uh, device to server and server to server. Um, it's a nice standard, but um, it has an encryption. No, it, it has addressing, it's quite well. It scales quite well, but there is no quality of service in it. So say in the example of Alstein, if you were to use this, then you wouldn't really 
have the timing requirement. You will meet the timing requirement for, say, send an alarm if the ship is going really badly. Uh, so you can't use this. And for Internet of Things, it's, uh, it's nice for server to server and device to server. You have AMQP, which is very secure. It's made for banking transactions. And they can uh, give you reliable message delivery, at most one, at least one, exactly one, and encryption. Uh, it is message oriented, so it doesn't give you the um, data centric approach of DDS, but it's, uh, it's very secure. MQTT, device to server, server to server. This is a lightweight protocol where you send data from little devices and into the cloud. Uh, that's the kind of traditional way of doing it, sending things to the server. But there's also a, a single point of failure if the server goes down. So um, they are not very intelligent devices this way because it's a centralized approach. A co-op is uh, small, lightweight, uh, for point-to-point um, -point communications. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that DDS is cover both device-to-device, device-to-server, and server-to-server, and it scales and has QoS, which makes it huge. So you can see DDS covers everything, <laughs> which is also why the protocol can be a little bit large to start grasping and look at all the possibilities of it. So when should you use DDS? You typically use it for large systems that will take long time to develop and will grow to multiple versions and last for a long time. Complex systems. And you use it when you need really fast, no latency, just uh, lots and lots of data sending between different applications. And you don't have a single point of failure. It's very easy to set up redundancy because everyone is talking to everyone, so the data stays in the network. So when do we not choose DDS? If you don't need it. If it's something simple, point to point, or, uh, or if you have very tiny microcontrollers, you just want to send a little bit of data, then you don't take the bother of learning the entire DDS and buying an implementation and using it. It's, it's kind of, uh, it's a broad standard. So it does a lot of stuff, which you won't need if you could just send UDP packets or Google protocol buffers or whatever. If that's all you need, DDS is probably not for you. This is an example of that. It's huge. It covers both the cloud, the fog, and the edge. which means you can set up a system with a lot of small devices, which lives in the edge, and communicates to each other directly. And this is the ring from Alstein where you just connect the network right in. And all the data just goes magically between all the devices. Then you can start setting up domains and central domains and supervisors and all that stuff and start using heavy tools and, uh, and you know, there was a requirement in Ulstan to do logging of all the data. So typically, you take a server and you set it up to just log everything that comes in. That means it subscribes to all the data that is in the loop. And all the data will also be sent to that server in addition to all the devices. Then you have a logging system. Yeah. 
So the goal is to have a middleware that hides your platform from you. So you don't have to know the operating system. You don't have to know IP addresses of what you connect. And uh, there's a lot of stuff you don't have to set up once the EDS is running, because they, it's basically it sends a lot of multicast packages everywhere to discover each other, and then builds its own network topology, discovers who listens to who, and uh, then you don't have to do that yourself. There are a lot of implementations. And uh, also, Kongsberg has one. I have no experience with it. Don't know anyone. Does anyone of you have used this? You? Yeah. yeah. Did you create it or just okay? <laughs> uh, when I was making this presentation, I uh, I learned that. Well, after I said yes to doing this presentation, someone told me, "Oh, did you know that the people at Kongsberg have their own uh, implementation?" And uh, that's like okay, so I'm. Uh, Coming here like a total noob and telling you guys, and you already know everything. But uh, <laughs> so uh, we discussed and we said like it's like being a hyena talking to the lions about uh, in their lion cave. So good. <laughs> and I didn't try the Kongsberg one. Yeah. They bought one. Yeah, uh, that's kind of um, why it was fast. I think if we were to implement our own DDS, we would still be sitting here uh, doing this. So they basically they bought the RTI one. They bought licenses for that, and um, they're quite established. They have uh, XML configuration of everything, and yeah, I don't know how Kongsberg is. It's all secret, I guess. And do you know if they can talk together? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. And the API is also fairly compatible. So if you have an application written for RTI, you can switch out them and use those instead. Mm -hmm. It's not that much need to change in your code. Okay. Cool. Good. So, yeah. Um, So the goal of the DDS is to have the right data at the right place at the right time. Right data is uh, done by filtering. You can set up content filtering, age filtering, life cycle, data rate. The right place, that's the discovery stuff I was talking about, where everyone discovers each other. It's also set up so that the subscriber knows if a publisher is uh, down. Uh, which is kind of useful for, uh, for instance, safety demands. And the right time, that's handled with the uh, quality of service policies, where you can set up a lot of stuff. Uh, you can set up, for instance, if, if there has been so and so much time since the last package was sent, you can say that this device is probably dead. Um, you can have deadlines, reliability, importance. You can prioritize all the packages so that the important stuff gets sent first. And the network from software point of view looks like this. Uh, you set up, as a publisher, you set up data writers, which sends topics. And then as a subscriber, you set up a data reader Writes the topic, uh, who reads the topics, like topic B, sent by data writer, and then there are three data readers listening to this topic. And the DDS middleware knows these connections, like they have, they know about these lines here. So if these three are not there, the data never goes anywhere, basically. So well communicated. So I tried to uh, 
make an example case which builds up to my demo um, to explain these data writer, data reader concepts. Um, the case here is that my computer, which looks like that, will send color to a Raspberry Pi with a LED LED, which can send, um, which can be red, green, blue, yellow. So that's the color data. Looks like this. And this is an IDL file. Uh, that's a standard as well from OMG. I guess you use IDL as well. And then RT gives you the possibility to just generate the code. You input the IDL file, and you just press run, and it generates a lot of code everywhere. <laughs> Looks like this. So the interesting files here are the lead publisher, lead subscriber. Then you have all these data files, which just handle how the data looks like and the relations to the data. Then you have the QoS here in an XML file, so you can specify what you want your QoS to look like. All the So in our case, you first have to specify the domain you will be working, because there might be several domains, and they don't know about each other. That. Then you have to set up participants to tell the software that you are participating on domain one. Then you have to specify if you're a subscriber or publisher, like so. And then you have to set up data writers and data readers for the color. The color is a topic, so that's the data we will be sending and receiving. And the QoS is I don't know, Kongsberg, do you do XML as well, or do you have your own format? For hmm? Yeah, okay. You can choose. But we have the same. I mean, the, the, what, what you can choose from is, is standardized. Mm -hmm. so we have the exact same final settings. The nodes are identical. Hmm. Yeah, so RTI chose to use XML for that, but I think. I think you can do it in the application as well, without touching XML. And typically it's stuff like um, you set up the reliability. And the interesting thing here is the history tag at the bottom, where you tell your data writer to keep all the sample it has been sending. So it just every time it sends a sample, it stores it in a big database for later use. And the same is true for um, the data reader. Here it's set up to keep the 10 last samples that you've been sent. That's useful for um, late joiners when you plug in a device that wants these data later on. Um, then these data readers and writers will cooperate and send the data where they're supposed to be. Then you can have ownership of data, which prevents everyone else from sending the data except you, if you have the highest ownership strength. And you can have um, redundancy, where the ownership, someone owns the data, but if they don't send anything for the, if they are out for five seconds, everyone else can send the data. So yeah, I'm going to try to demonstrate this with my little Raspberry Pi project.
So what I'm showing here is a publisher on the right, subscriber on the left. And I've set it up so that the publisher can send red, green, red, green at the push of a button. And then it's sent to the subscriber. Oh, and then I plugged in the wrong device. This is slow because it's uh, Raspberry Pi booting time. And at the start of the Raspberry Pi, I run a, a subscriber, which will light these little balls. Can you all see these little balls? No? I should probably find a way. like this. So again, this is my homemade hardware from tonight. So fingers crossed. So this one is subscribed to the data. I can blink. And if I unplug this one, Change the color to red. Plug it back. Fingers crossed. It's red. So that's the late joiner. Now I have this one, which I uh, accidentally plugged earlier. And it's configured differently. So let's just see what happens when it boots. This one failed to boot entirely. Oh, this one turned blue. This is a publisher. So this published blue, and this one received blue. If I now, with this one, keep publishing red and green, nothing happens because I've set up this one to have a higher ownership value. So this is prioritized. So you can see on the display next here, got color blue, nothing happens. I send and I send and I send, but who cares, I'm not the priority. I'm not the owner of this data. But let's try to unplug this one. And keep sending. There we go. There's a five second timeout. So now it's lighting. Oh, and this one is back up as well. So they keep blinking together. Yay. So this is many hours to make a glorified <laughs> Christmas light. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, I think that's all. I have no idea. <laughs> and I'm happy I don't, I don't have to know.
it's no, it's completely distributed. So all I do is to include this middleware DDS stuff, and then okay, you answer that, yeah. Other questions? Yeah? Do you have different uh, configuration for each reader? Uh, different QS configurations for the readers? Or do, do they have to be synchronized with the reader and writer? You can add different. You can um, set up profiles. So, so each reader can have their own profile depending on their needs or reliability or so on. Mm. That's also how I made this one have a stronger ownership, because it has a data writer profile that is different from these ones. Or from, yeah, this one. Yeah? You also mentioned the domains that uh, limited the distribution of the data. Uh, You can set up uh, a relay between domains. I don't remember what they're called. Do you remember? <laughs> well, we, we don't have any, any pre-made relays, but, but you can, any application can create any number of publishers to join any number of domains. And so if you want to, to move something from A to B, you just read it, read it from a reader and then publish it on a different writer from a different domain. Mm. Mm. I think also RGI has some kind of Finnish built yeah. thingy. Yeah. But uh, it's quite, it's not very hard to set up because you choose the domain. Just two domains, yeah. Mm. Other questions? Just one question. Why didn't the, uh, the publisher turn blue again? Why did the user not want to use the blue publisher? Hmm. That's my uh, quality of service configuration. So it's only sends like once when it boots. So if I am to reboot, then the data is considered fresh again. So it kind of sees the data as old. That's the, oh yeah, I know that. I know an answer for this. That's the liveness duration had passed. So then the data is not the best data anymore. And then somehow it doesn't pick them up. I was actually expecting that to happen the first time I tried this, so I'm not that into the uh, these details. Question. Yeah. Uh, EDS is a protocol. You have various implementations of EDS. Uh, are you guaranteed that every implementation provides all the same quality or, or uh, performance, like you say, transfer has it as its own compared to RTI? Are there any differences? Well, there are some, but, but you have this sort of minimum profile that everybody supports, okay. which is basically point-to-point. -point. But then you have uh, more advanced stuff like persistence, for instance, that reduce 
stores that disk and then publishes the data on automatically on boot time. And that's not part of the minimum profile, so that I can't. So the standard specifies uh, minimum standard? Yeah. And then you have additional add-on standards like security and business that we're all implementing now to, to encrypt traffic. Okay. Is the standard explicit enough to, to uh, combine several, like you have RPI and uh, so implementation now, but it, is it possible to combine different implementations? Yes. I was uh, in my ambitious planning period. I was planning to have different on each of the Raspberry Pis. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> because I, I'm thinking of like a good standard. You know, example, I have to go to to vendors to to get an API and um, create publishers and so on. So you might end up with a lot of different implementations. Mm. Uh, I guess not everybody uses that RTI. No, absolutely not. Um, I think RTI are, uh, is among the most established ones. And um, that's probably why they chose it. But I also think they're quite expensive, I believe. But, uh, yeah? I have a question. Um, use EDL to define the data. You, you compile the data on each device. It should be the same ideal definition. Both, if, if it's not the same, if it's changed version, uh, what happens? Is there some mechanism to detect it? Or, uh, mm. I know that if you have different quality of service uh, completely, like there's something wrong, then they stop talking. But what happens if you have... Um, Okay, cool. No more questions? Yeah, like the design process, you mean? Yeah, does anyone have, have experience with that? If it's tricky, is there any problems? Mm, it's a hard question. <laughs> Generally, the design itself is very tricky, but choosing the right range of services might be if you don't if you haven't actually built a built a US specification office. Okay. Thanks. That's all I had. <laughs>